Well, good morning. Let's stand up. Begin a time of praise with one another. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the head. Christ is born on Christmas Day. Man, you can be seated. It's Christmas time, and you can always tell here in the sanctuary when it's Christmas time when you see the beautiful decorations. Not your ladies, not your ladies. The decorations up. Sorry, and the ladies, and the ladies. But the Christmas trees up, and the decorations in the hallway, the decorations in the foyer. And we just want to say thank you to the host of ladies. And there's some men also involved in that that uh, take care of the decorations for us. So. Thank you so much for making us look festive and get into the season uh, as we celebrate uh, Christ's birth this morning. Are you excited about Christmas season? Away in the manger and all the good songs that we get to sing. Uh, just stay put right there. We're going to experience uh, the ordinance of baptism this morning. So take your attention to the baptistry. Yeah, the beautiful trees, and they were gracious enough to put one nut among the trees. <laughs> So it's so good. We're going to have the, the ordinance of baptism, and it's a very special time. And very, come on, man. 
Uh, and it's very uh, special for me. It's always uh, special when I have an opportunity to baptize someone. But this little one has come to know Jesus Christ as her Savior. And come on, girl. <laughs> I, I may have to hold her above water. Can y'all see her? Can you see her now? <laughs> I want you to know that, that not long ago, uh, Ryan and Sandra Hebert started asking questions, or Emma started asking questions about her salvation, and she worked through the process. And we baptized Sister Emma not long ago, didn't we? Well, this is her little sister, Melody. And do you confess Jesus as your Savior? She does. And, uh, and you know, uh, she may be, in your eyes, she may be young, but she understands salvation as a six or seven year old would understand salvation. She knows that she is saved. And this baptism, this water, is, is really is, is not saving. Uh, the dirt and stuff that's in this water, uh, it's not perfect, it's not clean. But what is perfect and clean is the fact that she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And this is an outward expression of what's already happened on the inside. So let me. You okay? Okay. Oh, okay. Melt upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried in this likeness and death, but we're raised to walk in a newness of life. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Always, always a special time to be able to experience the ordinance of baptism. Amen. I want to welcome you to our to our church this morning. If you're if you're new to our congregation, thank you for choosing to come and worship with us. And you'll see some information on the card that uh, was handed to you when you walked in the in the uh, auditorium this morning, just about how to get connected with us. Uh, just some information that we'd like for you to share with us, if you would. Uh, that'll be your offering for us. This morning, you come back next week. You got to give money, but uh, this week you just just fill out your information. But uh, we just want to have a record of that. How can how we can meet your needs and how uh, we can further see how you can meet our needs as well uh, as we try to fellowship to, uh, together. Um, there's also some information there concerning some of the Christmas uh, events that we have. I won't I won't bore you with that, but they're listed there as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming and, and actually choosing to come and worship with us. There's, and we know there's lots of uh, other places that you could come and, uh, and fellowship with us. Let's stand together and we'll call uh, Wynn, if you would, come and pray for us. And we'll be uh, preparing. Men, if you would, come forward and we'll uh, take the offering now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day where we can come together and sing praises to your name and and worship you, worship a living, living, risen Savior, Lord. Father, as we move into this offertory portion of our service, we ask you to bless the gift and the giver, and Lord, that uh, it may go on to the further into your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Just remain standing if you would. <laughs> song says, oh, come let us adore him.
song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to come into your presence and to adore you. Thank you so much for that, Christ. Came into our presence. And the angels said, come and adore you. Step down from heaven, humbly you came, God of all creation, here with us in a starlit manger. Peace. 
on earth, here with us, joy awakening, at your feet we fall. Father, thank you so much for the privilege that you do give us to come into your presence. Father, we look forward to hearing your message this morning. Speak to us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you would, go ahead and be seated. Thank you. finally here. The child I've been hoping for my whole life is finally born. For so long, I thought I'd never be able to have children, but thanks to the Lord, my prayers have been answered. I come from the lineage of Aaron, a respected and well-known family. I also married an honorable priest, Zechariah. We were both educated and knew the scriptures thoroughly. I prayed often and walked with the Lord, but I still felt abandoned by Him when I could never have children. It was shameful to be barren. In fact, I was worried people would think that I had done something to make the Lord angry. I wasn't bitter about it. I only felt as if God had forgotten about me. I knew that if I never had a child, there could be no one to take care of me once my husband dies. Did God not care that I could end up so alone? Time went on, I got older, and I gradually lost hope of having children of my own. I continued to pray, but eventually it was too late. My husband and I accepted that we would never be given the gift of a child. Until one day. Zechariah was given a message from the angel Gabriel himself. We would be given a child and he would do wondrous things. He would turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and his name would be John. For the first time in years, I felt joy. I was relieved that God had heard my prayers. I was reminded of the stories of Hannah and Sarah, who both could not have children until God answered their prayers, and their sons did great things in the eyes of the Lord. Months later, my cousin Mary came to visit me. As she came up to the house, I immediately felt something different about her, and my baby felt it too. I can only describe him as jumping for joy when Mary came to us. Somehow, I knew she was pregnant, and I knew that the baby inside her was very special. Deep down, I could feel the Lord telling me that this was His Son, the one sent to save us. Mary would be the one to deliver this child, this Savior. The baby we had all been waiting for was finally here. The first candle on the Advent wreath is called the Prophecy Candle. It opens the period that anticipates Christmas and remembers those who first spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. Elizabeth knew the prophesied Messiah was to come and the baby in her womb would be the one to prepare the way for him. This Christmas season, we patiently await the coming of the King. God of light, 
place a candle in our hearts so we may walk as children of the light, treading gently on the paths of peace and ever ready to welcome the signs of new life. Amen. I appreciate these young ladies helping us, and they will be doing so through the season of Advent, our Christmas season, and you'll hear their monologues from week to week. Today, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We are looking at the, the subject of the women who welcome Christmas. You've heard of the three wise men, I'm sure, but have you heard of the three wise women? Three women. Three women that we will look at that are the first mentioned to encounter Jesus in the gospel accounts. In fact, Luke gives us a pretty detailed account of Elizabeth that you heard from just a moment ago. Mary and Anna, each of which experienced Jesus in the most remarkable and revelatory ways. A midlife barren woman without child, a a young virgin and elderly widow all have something to tell us this Christmas season about the Messiah. Before we finish this Advent season, we will know the names and the character of these three women, all of which welcomed Christmas. What you think you know about Christmas, Luke will challenge, and he will inform. Luke's details inform traditions, and they expose some of the superstitions that we have around this subject of of Christmas. But in the end, The most told story in the history of the world will inform your understanding and recalibrate your priorities. And so I want you to open your Bible and as stories go, long ago, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, verse 5 of chapter 1, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Here we are introduced to Zechariah, a priest, a priest among many priests that's walking the streets of Jerusalem. Zechariah, one priest amidst the hundreds, 24 divisions of priests that were devoted to this single task of carrying out the temple functions. Everything to do with the temple since the time of Aaron. Priests were responsible for the sacrificial offerings, for the public prayer, for the singing of praises, and for A few of them, a very limited number of them, would be singled out to be able to serve in this privileged place there in the temple. For Zechariah, it would be around the table of incense. Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, a daughter of Aaron, is a woman of great consequence. If Zechariah is the elderly priest who's been a long-standing faithful priest, then it's Elizabeth who is the strength behind her man's life. A notable woman indeed that we find that Luke gives us detail about. They were both of Aaron's lineage, being exceptional people. I've seen couples like this, and you probably have as well. Exceptional, faithful to the Lord and to one another, happily married, gracious, serving the Lord together. And they were both righteous, Luke tells us in in verse 6. They were righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. Luke describes these these two people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, as being righteous and blameless. They had demonstrated a life of godliness, one of purposeful living, a holy life, living honorably before the Lord and before God. Their goodness is noteworthy, and this is what Luke wants us to see. He wants us to see their goodness and their holy living. It's something that certainly priests of that day would have been challenged in as well as people of our day to put together holy living day after day, week after week, month after month, and yet this is the life that they lived. But how? How did they do this? How were they able to manage this kind of godly living? Not in their own strength. Certainly it had to be that they lived, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they had to live in in the power of God that was working in them. Like the Apostle Paul who wrote these words in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, he said, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to accomplish. 
And so at this point, what could possibly go wrong with the story which seems to be quite remarkable from the beginning of two godly people living out their life before the Lord? But this is where the story takes a dramatic turn. Verse 7 says that they had no child. They were childless because Elizabeth was barren and both of them were advanced in years. They were experiencing what what about one in ten couples here in our own country experience, experiences every single day barrenness. Can you imagine that? Some of you certainly know it by experience. You see, you can live a good and godly life and still be affected by bad and adversarial circumstances. Bad things do happen to good people. It's easy to be faithful when everything is what you want it to be, but the real test occurs when disappointment comes knocking at your door and sorrow pulls up a chair at your kitchen table. Oh, Elizabeth, she was barren. She was without a child. Year after year, for so long that Zachariah and Elizabeth are not even, they're not even capable of having children anymore. They're past the years of, of having children. Putting it bluntly, they were just too old to have children. That's the reality. Hope in their ability is long gone, yet they continue to believe in the goodness of God. A very important matter indeed. This is not the first time that God has come alongside a barren couple. If you know anything about the scriptures, you know that there are multiple stories in which God in miraculous fashion shows up and he brings a child into the lives of a barren couple. We know the story of Abraham and Sarah ended with a baby in the arms of a 90-year-old woman named Sarah. A miracle indeed, Genesis 17. The scripture says, or Luke tells us, that they had no child. It doesn't seem like maybe much to you, but for that person who's experiencing barrenness, it certainly is relevant. Remember, these are two godly people, but even so, they must have struggled with questions that they had concerning uh, the Lord. They they must have occupied their mind. For instance, are, are we not faithful enough? Does God really see my need? When will God answer my prayers? Do we really want to attend another couple's function with little children running around only to remind us of the children that we don't have? These were real experiences, real thoughts. I imagine, certainly, that Zacharias and Elizabeth experienced. When Elizabeth joined the other women around the community well, she probably grew weary of hearing all the old tales about how you could become pregnant if you do this or if you do that, only to find out the next month that it was not a reality in her life. Culturally, and it seems Luke acknowledges this, the woman was usually the one to blame for the infertility. In fact, Elizabeth likely thought that she had failed at the most basic level of what it meant to be a woman because she couldn't have a child. A wife was expected to to give her husband children, specifically sons, and not doing so could bring humiliation to the family and in some cases could even bring bring about divorce. So Elizabeth probably would have quietly suffered alone in her pain had it not been for her godly husband, Zachariah, who was there with her. Their faith strengthened them, but did not keep them from their hardships. Their faith strengthened them, but did not keep them from their hardships. Probably something for us all to remember. Elizabeth fought back her doubts as she waited and prayed, and she listened to the comforting psalms of old. Faith is believing what isn't seen and what isn't apparent. Faith is believing what isn't seen and what is not apparent. The stage is being set. Luke is setting it just right so that we can understand the story, maybe in a way that we've never appreciated it before. The stage being set for God to step out onto the stage of human history. Like the Apostle Paul said, for in the fullness of times, the Lord came. The miracle was about to be released to a barren couple upon the world. If he did it once, certainly he could do it again. Could he not? Luke tells us in verse 8, Now as Zechariah was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by law to enter the temple of the Lord and there to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside of the hour of incense. 
That is, of all the times to be called up, Zechariah is selected in one of the most unusual ways that you could possibly find in Scripture, by the casting of lots. Chance, or maybe not. Understand this. An older priest in what doesn't look like a r- real spiritual process, something to ke- akin to like rolling dice, right? Zechariah gets selected on that basis in the temple. But I want you to hear something very clearly. Here, a sovereign God uses a human process to put his plan to work. It's beyond my understanding, to be honest with you, but God works in spite of the statistical improbability that men trust in. Only God can bring purpose out of what appears to be simple chance. Due to the number of priests, it was highly unlikely for this to occur and would be the only time in Zechariah's life that he would experience it. Many of the priests would have never had the opportunity that Zechariah had on this occasion to be in the temple at the altar of incense. So it must have been God sovereignly orchestrating these events. A one-time life opportunity to offer sweet incense at the altar was just moments away. So there Zachariah stood inside the temple and he would burn the incense. The people were outside the temple and, and and they were praying. And Elizabeth, she was no doubt in the court of women and devoted with the other devoted women praying like, like Anna and Mary that we'll hear about in, in the weeks to come as a part of the women who welcome Christmas. This is the story of the women who welcome Christmas. And I draw this out to us because I want us to see these unique contributions of these godly women that would have really defied the understanding of the first century to cite a woman as the one who gives us the first evidences and testimonies of the life of Jesus. And yet, this is exactly what the gospel writers give us. Unknown to Elizabeth, when all this has taken place, her husband has entered into the temple itself, is burning incense at the altar. Unknown to her, a miracle is in the making. It's happening as she waits, as she prays. It is something truly indeed to be amazed at. Zechariah, with great privilege, now finds himself burning the incense at the altar. In verse 11, Luke tells us, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will call his name John. Zechariah's encounter with the angel is like many other that Luke, he he records for us. There's this sense of overwhelming fear that strikes him, this jaw-dropping awe that awaits all who encounter the presence of the Lord. And this revelation that Luke gives us concerning the birth of the Christ child this revelation, Luke tells us, he, he tells them not to be afraid. The angel tells Zechariah that, don't be afraid. He says, your prayers are, are going to be answered. You're going to have a son. You're going to name him, you're going to name him John. Your wife, Elizabeth, not a surrogate, is going to be the one who actually conceives that child and brings forth that child. Now, whether the prayer for a son was a recent one, it certainly was a relevant one for Zechariah. And to the angel Gabriel, who's given the responsibility to come and bring the news. The news of what's transpiring. How would he and Elizabeth become the parents they had always wanted to be? Every conception, really, if you look at it, every conception has a touch of the miraculous, doesn't it? But this one has an extraordinary aspect to it. Elizabeth, barren, past the age of having children... But not anymore. And you will have joy, Luke tells us in verse 14. You have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before them in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready the Lord a people prepared. Imagine hearing these words 
Imagine hearing these words, all of these accolades of what your son is going to be. It's what every godly parent wants for their child. That they would grow up and make a difference for the Lord. Certainly. From the moment of conception, John would bring joy and gladness, causing many to rejoice at his birth. Like, like Elijah of old, John would stand as a courageous prophet in his day, in his generation of young people. He would understand his greatest calling was the proclaiming of Jesus. And in every generation, our greatest calling is to proclaim Jesus. John's mission would be to prepare the hearts of the people for the most significant person in history, Jesus. John the Baptist would be the son that they had always wanted in their life. Verse 18, Luke tells us that Zechariah says, speaks to the angel, how shall I know this? I mean, he's just heard all of these things about his son to be. And he says, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him saying, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you didn't believe my words, which would be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay inside the temple. With all the things that Zechariah hears, with, with, with all the things that he hears about his son John to be, he responds, how shall I know? How shall I know? He, he justifies, and this is what is really a challenge to us. He, he justifies his lack of faith with facts. Real facts. I'm old. Elizabeth is advanced in years. Notice the really smooth way that he does that, right? <laughs> Zachariah struggles to believe, and as a result, he's left unable until John, unable to speak until John, his son, is actually born. Like, like Zachariah, I think sometimes we forget who we're talking to. Zechariah needed to stop thinking in human terms and get the big picture. Sometimes we forget the incredible story of redemption, but this is the story of Christmas, is it not? Jesus came to rescue us from our doubts and to save us from our sins. That's why he came. Elizabeth was beyond childbearing years, but not beyond the touch of God, the creator of all things, the author of life. God chose her, an older woman with an unproven womb, in order to display his power, his might, his authority, and to bless her faithfulness. This is what Luke wants us to see with these great details. God's strength is fully revealed when our strength is fully depleted. That's when he loves to show up. The scene outside the temple. Luke gives us this description. The people are outside. They're praying. Where's Zechariah? They're wondering what's, what's taking longer than normal. Normally, when, when, when the priests are there and they, they burn the incense the, over a certain expected a reasonable amount of time, they come out from the temple itself. Imagine what news traveled to Elizabeth. Finally, I speculate about this, but no doubt, uh, you know, or at least possibly thinking, somebody went to Elizabeth and said, I don't want you to be concerned, but Zachariah still hasn't come out of the temple. We don't know what's going on. And you don't just send anybody into the temple area. Luke tells us in verse 22, but when he came out, he did come out. When he did come out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Sometimes our silence is born of reverence. Sometimes our silence is born of fear. But for Zechariah, his silence was, was something of a holy necessity in his life. The loss of speech was evidence of God's presence and God's power. God was moving 
in their midst. Sometimes our circumstances can get worse before they get better. He doesn't have a child, and now he can't speak with the expectation that one day he will have a child. But now he can't even say anything about it. Childless, discouraged, and now one of the greatest moments of his life. Can you imagine being in the temple and serving at the altar of incense? This is the highlight of a priest's life. And yet, he can't speak. So when Zechariah emerges from the temple, the people expect him to come out and to make the declaration of Aaron as they would have done. Which would have been the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and to give you peace. But nothing was spoken. Instead, they got silence. Howbeit, he did start a first century game of charades with them, drawing out with clues um, as to what had happened, hoping that they might get an understanding. But if you can't speak and you've never really learned sign language before, how do you communicate in a language you don't even know yet an encounter with the angel from the Lord? How do you do that? You know Elizabeth was going to get some answers from him for sure. And indeed, she did. Hard to know who would have been more frustrated trying to communicate and with one another that day. Can't you see them both using hand motions as they, as they try to communicate with, with, with one another? It's hard to communicate what big plans that God has in store for us sometimes. But he does have big plans alone under their own roof together communicating she comes to understand the good news no doubt Zachariah probably wrote it out had to spell it out this is what but they communicated together what had actually taken place as he encountered Gabriel there in the temple Elizabeth with less information than Zachariah and without a direct angelic contact she simply believes Elizabeth believes She doesn't doubt. The barren woman now shows incredible faith and and she begins to act in accordance to what she believes. There's no record of her doubting. She just simply trusts. While waiting to know of her pregnancy, Elizabeth is careful, anticipating, you know, what is about to transpire in, in, in her life. In verse 24, Luke tells us, in these days, His wife, Elizabeth, conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my approach among the people. Just like that, a miracle is in the making. The first woman to know that God was up to something big was Elizabeth. While she believed God, Elizabeth was not ready to reveal in public what had been disclosed to her in private didn't mean that she lacked faith no doubt it just meant that time time precisely five months was needed before the miracle could begin to show it needed time for five months she didn't leave the house at all why we don't know exactly but you know how people can wag their tongues don't you I mean you know how people can gossip she easily could have been the hot topic of the community given what had happened with her husband in the temple I mean no doubt they were talking about that for sure and now and now this if there was speculation around what had happened to her and her husband can you imagine the side eye that they were given this woman as she emerged after five months now being pregnant Wow, how people can speak and talk. Maybe she wanted to savor those five, in those five months through prayer and, and devotion what God was doing. We don't know exactly what was transpiring in her mind. I know that, but she waited, the scriptures tells us. And there must have been a reason. The baby bump needed time to become a baby belly. It needed to become obvious. She wanted to come out in public and say, it's real. This is real. Clearly, at that point, people would have had to believe her story. It would have been obvious, at least to most. In the end, she believed that God had been merciful to her. That's what she believed. She believed that that God had removed the social stigma associated with their inability to get pregnant for so many years in her life. Keep in mind, Zachariah is still deaf and dumb. Uh, uh, you know, when Elizabeth emerges in public, the only thing he could possibly, when they, ask, when they would talk, try to talk with him, the only thing he could do is just point to her 
It's the best communication you can give, just point. Years of suffering had brought Elizabeth near to the heart of God. And it could very well be that your years of suffering have brought you near and dear to the heart of God. Now she could say, the Lord has done this for me. She could, she could say that children are a blessing from the Lord. She could say these things. Now people will stop thinking there's something wrong with me. Now we know that there wasn't anything wrong with her. But at least others would have seen this. Her public disgrace was now over. God had shown her favor. Now women would speak of God's grace in her life as the first woman to welcome Christmas. Do you realize she's the first And then there's Mary, and then there's Anna. These are the women who welcome Christmas for us. Barren no more, blessed forevermore. She had encountered the God who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we might ever ask or think. That's the God that she met in those days. If you fast forward in time, we see in the story that Luke records for us as we move through the, the first chapter of Luke that Elizabeth has a cousin named Mary. And in verse 39, in those days, Mary arose and she went with haste to the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and she greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaked in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord, very important statement should come to me. These are incredible details that Luke gives to us. Elizabeth hears Mary's voice. Just just hearing her voice causes the baby, John, to leap in her womb. And she's filled with the Holy Spirit. She prophesies that as she speaks of the things that that are going to come. Understand the significance of Elizabeth's prophecy. It is the first in over 400 years. When was the last time that God had spoken? It was through the prophet Malachi. And now these prophetic words come off her lips concerning her son, concerning Mary's son. At six months pregnant, Elizabeth feels her little human That, yeah, right? That little human who, when he hears the voice of Mary, is stimulated to to jump when when he hears her voice. It's not the first time that she has felt him move, no doubt. She has sensed him moving around. I certainly don't know this by experience, but I mean, certainly those little ones moving around to get a little bit more comfortable in those crowded conditions that they survive in for nine months. But no, this is something different. This isn't just a little baby moving around. This is something unique. Filled with the Spirit, he leaps. He he jumps in his mother's womb. The Spirit of God swept through Elizabeth and caused John to leap with a sense of joy. Joy and the filling of the Spirit are so vitally connected together. This is the precursor to what would happen on the day of Pentecost some 30 years later when, when the people of God were filled with the Spirit and hundreds of people were filled with the Spirit of God. Please, how could John be filled with the Spirit bef- before birth if he were not already a little human, safeguarded by his mother's womb and by her decision to value his precious life. Gabriel had announced from the time when he is yet a child in his mother's womb, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is John. Obviously moved by the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth begins to proclaim the blessedness of Mother Mary, who is caring you-know-who. Jesus, Jesus, a spirit-filled person can't resist proclaiming the good news of Jesus. When we are filled with the Spirit, 
The spirit of joy filling the hearts of true believers, moving us to this uncharacteristic emotional exuberance at the revelation of who Jesus is. If we can't get excited around Christmas about the story of Jesus, then what can we possibly get excited about which will be lasting? And a little bit more excitement based upon the last week might be a better expression. Elizabeth realizes the first and, first and foremost whose presence that she's in. She's in the presence of Jesus. It, it's, it's, it's amazing because in verse 43, Luke says, what does she say? She says, my Lord, my Lord, that my Lord should come to me. She is the first person to recognize Jesus for who he is. My Lord. My Lord. Don't miss this. This revelation that, that, that she understands. Elizabeth proclaims to Mary that she is truly pregnant and carrying the Lord. Not just another child. But the Christ child, the anointed one, the creator of all the universe, there's no competitive pregnancy between these two women. It's just a great celebration, a realization um, by Elizabeth and Mary that she is carrying the Christ child. She is the first in the Gospels to recognize this and to make this extraordinary confession, to confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is who he is. Because the Holy Spirit moving within her revealed to her the truth of it, she was able to know it. And this is exactly what happens when the Holy Spirit reveals to you who Jesus is. That's how you're able to know him. And without the revelation of the Spirit of God showing you who Jesus is, there's no way for us to know. So to know who Jesus is, is to recognize what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, making Jesus known, which is why he came, to make Jesus known to us. Three women who welcome Christmas, who invite us into the story that we think we know so well. But unless you're barren and not able to have had a child, maybe you don't know this story quite as well as you thought you knew it. Some of you know it by your own experience. But what Elizabeth teaches us is that when we encounter the Lord, when we encounter the Lord, we must recognize him as the Lord. I want you to bow your heads with me. Christmas is about acknowledging and recognizing that Jesus Christ the Son of God has been born of a virgin. Mary, whose life that we'll look at next week, that will tell us about the continued story of Christmas. That we would worship and adore him. That we would, that we would acknowledge him. Don't underestimate the power of the Spirit of God in your life. The Holy Spirit who makes known to us who Jesus is. Without the Holy Spirit, it just seems to be another story. And maybe that's how it is for you today. In fact, maybe you're not even listening anymore. This is another story. But this is not just another story. This is the story of Christmas. And we welcome that story. We embrace it. Year after year, I think and reflect on the the birth narratives in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Amazing stories. And without fail, I go back and read these and think, boy, have I missed some details, haven't I? But Luke is a doctor, and he fills in with so many interesting, de essential details to help fill out the story for us so that we really know the impact of, of what happened that day nearly 2,000 years ago. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ, then this is your moment. The Holy Spirit is making it, making it known to you that you need Jesus as your Savior. If you would recognize with Elizabeth that he is Lord, 
that he is, as she said, my Lord. And for you, for you today to be able to say, Lord, you are my Lord. I recognize you as my Lord. I give you my heart, my life. I thank you that you came into this world to give your life for me. Father, we, we come before you today and we recognize your son Jesus. We thank you for the story, the story of Christmas, the story that we want to know more about. And for those here today that, Lord, you, you've touched their heart by your spirit, I pray that we would respond in the way that you want us to, that we would acknowledge that you are Lord indeed. In Jesus' name, let's stand together. Let's worship. As we sing, you come. Come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore Him, the Lord. Worship Christ. The Lord, let all that is within us adore, adore. Come, let us adore. God. I hope in these weeks that we, leading up to Christmas, you're taking time, think through the story, read through the Gospels, be familiar. You'll be hearing from several of our uh, young ladies uh, the stories of these three women that we'll hopefully learn more about uh, Christmas uh, through them. God bless you. Have a great day.